it actually means vessel, not just vein. So that's kind of a tricky one. Uh, my myo has a lot. It's a little tricky. And my this is my own. Myositis. Cardiomyopathy would be bad muscle in the heart. Uh, this is L I S I S. This is
them. Um, they have some, a lot of good stuff on this website, so I highly encourage you to look at that. flashcards on that, so I do think you need to learn the medical terminology for procedures of ink, but also the anatomy. So it's quite a bit to go through. Um, they have practice quizzes. Um, and now, you know, an overview of the medical record, obviously there's compliance issues. There's the uh, HPI issue, the present illness. As you know, we like a lot of words, and we like to use abbreviations. So you'll hear HPI, uh, past medical social family history, so PMFSH, uh, review systems and the physical exam. So, the key is that it has to be legible. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be totally spelled right, but pretty close. Um, I highly recommend you learn the abbreviations, so when you have the free text, um, you'll be able to document quicker. And then see whatever your provider, as a doctor or, or a, a PA or nurse practitioner, allows you to do. Um, and when you document the medical history, and this is kind of a review for you guys, you need the chief complaint right. I'll be frank, I've seen so, I get so frustrated about the chief complaint. I never get it right. So talk to your providers to how they like the chief complaint. You think it's a simple thing, but just if you just put F slash O, F slash U, which I see a lot, which means follow up, it doesn't really tell you much. Understand the medical records are they're going to be searching for key terms. And so you'd like to say, like, what you're here for in the patient's own words, and I'm giving the duration. My left knee hurts for two months. Something along those lines. Then there's obviously um, this. The medical history, the examination, diagnostic test, assessment, the clinical impression, uh, the plan, and then um, you want to identify both yourself as well as the uh, person who's going to sign off the chart. You guys are going to be medical scribes, so you're not really allowed to sign off the chart. Uh, that's practicing law without that license, and we will visit you in prison, but we really don't want to do that. So there's a lot of legality to this. Um, um, something that um, you'll see a lot of the providers talk about is the MDM, which is the medical decision making. And so uh, the theory is that when you're doing a note, you really want to, I think, use it for the next time you see the patient to jog your memory and or for the next provider. Um, it, it's really good and this is how you get your reputation around town is they're going to see your notes and they really judge you by your notes. So what you want to say is like, like say a uh, patient comes in uh, with, with fever and with a sore throat and they just don't feel good. Um, you're thinking that it's viral and the reason is we did a stuff test it was negative and uh, there's no other signs or symptoms of malignancy. So we decided to do watchful waiting. So when they come back and they have lymphoma because you missed it, you can say, look, I didn't think of it at that time. When I thought of lymphoma, I didn't think of the time it was. You don't have to be perfect, they just want you to at least kind of explain your logic. So the MDM becomes very important. Um, it's also a way for you to kind of make up for the uh, for the uh, for the exam. So for example, I want to I didn't bring this in, but I was going to show you uh, uh, sort of where I, I get very frustrated. So a patient of mine um, basically you know, made some bad choices and got some disease called syphilis. Um, and so I didn't have the special medicine you need for that. I don't have it, so I sent him to the ER. I sent the ER for the he had a lot of lesions in his Australian region down under. And so that's how we say it in the locker room. Yeah, he's an Australian rash. He has an Australian rash. And so um, they went there, and basically on the exam it said patient deferred or you know, patient declined to be examined. But in the MDM, he talked about what it looked like and all this stuff. So that's a, an obvious thing where think they just kind of cut and pasted something that doesn't align. So, Understand that whatever they come in for, you want to make sure that that's on your exam. Like the only thing I sent the guy in for was simple. Like the only thing you needed to document, and they didn't do it. So th that happens, unfortunately, a lot. But that's where um, you want to make sure you, you do that. And then in the MDM, you kind of explain what the treatment plan was. And, and it doesn't have to be a lot of words. Um, we'll talk about something called Oakland Grazer. But it has to be succinct so that when you read it, you go, okay, that sounds reasonable. That's what I would probably do. So medical records continue. All the history documentation rationale should be there for, I think, the next position. So think about if you were the person seeing this patient next. What would you like to have there? Um, what would you like to have explained? And so it doesn't have to be long. We don't want a note flow, but we'd like to have it correct. Um, now. I always say people come in for two things these days. 
Um, because of the way what's called EDIS and all these things where we get measured by how we do, it's what they come in for, and did we talk about all these what's called, I call them HCMs or healthcare maintenance. You know, do you smoke and, and alcohol? And the way they might ask it is they'll give them a big like, do you smoke, you know, seven cases a day? Oh no, not seven, it's two, you know? And so there's those things, but those should be looked at. And again, wherever you're going, ask them about those things, because you'll look like a star if like you kind of remember all remember asking about smoking or, or that. Because the goal is to get you, because you all pre-med, you act like a team, and then you'll learn this stuff. Um, now the, the documentation, especially for someone like myself, who's a secondary provider, who's the primary care provider, everybody? Dr. Google. So I'm a secondary provider, there's a Dr. Google. But when I see my charts, I want to see what the progress is. Are they worse or better? Are they the same? Uh, and then is there uh, something that we need to change around? Should I get rid of a diagnosis or should I add on another diagnosis? Um, and then there's a bunch of codes. So everything is uh, computerized. And so there's going to be two sets of codes you're going to need to learn about. One is called CPT, and the other is ICD-10. And these are things that you can kind of look at that a little bit, like depending on what you have, um, you have the right code. And so if you have Wilson's disease, does anyone know what Wilson's disease is? Copper uh, overdose. Actually, I'm sorry, copper deficiency. So if you have copper deficiency, that's Wilson's disease. Um, if you have um, sort of uh, problems with iron, this unspecified, there's actually people that look like they're rusting because they have too much iron, they can't get rid of their iron. So these are all the different codes, and you can see how there's like five codes, seven codes, and all of those are, are very important. The challenge we have, well, CPT codes are the ones that you use for procedures. So CPT is for procedures, so the P means procedures. So it's current procedural terminology. So there's not that many of them, and once you get into a certain place, you'll kind of use the same CPT codes over and over again. We use what's called e &M CPT codes, which are basically evaluation and management codes. So wherever you go, so if you CPT codes, you may be asked to do that, or they may, you, know, you may ask them what's a CPT code. So that's what that is. And again, it's one of those things that you can look up. There are huge books to look at it, uh, but it's very particular because if you don't code it right, you don't get paid. And if they don't get paid, you don't get paid. And so that's really important to get that done. Um, I get a kick out of ICD-10. It was ICD-9. This is International Classification Diseases. Um, we doctors hate ICD-10, uh, mainly because it's a challenge. Um, they just switched it from ICD-9 to ICD-10. I went through a whole semester long course on it. And the reason for that is there's 68,000 codes. We just have just a couple thousand codes. And there actually is a code in case you get bit by an orca. <laughs> so memorize this one, W56.21XS. And so the X means nothing, it's just a, to keep the space. So there's a whole science so you can see it's orca sequela, because there is an orca um, initial, and then there's an or orca of, of uh, it sequela and solar continuity. So anyway, it's like there's goofy things in there, and that, these are stuff, this is like a good example. The other one that I like, these are my two favorite that are like water back to this, is burn due to water skis on fire initial, <laughs> not the sequela. So if, for chance, I don't know, and I think it's like people like to go through flames or something else, but they have to have coats. So understand that it's impossible to know all 68,000 coats, at least for me, but you're going to need to kind of struggle with learning those coats. Um, now, what's nice is uh, some of the uh, places like Practice Fusion or some of the websites will allow you to put in something and then give you the code. So there are coding classes. If you really want to be good, you can become uh, a coder and that's a whole other class you can do. Again, if you're trying to be more and more valuable, learning how to code would be very, very good. Um, so the other is that in these uh, EHRs, electronic health records, they have guides for everything, and they have videos for everything. So I just want to show you. So this is the. EHR that I use, it's the most popular one around, and at least it's um, Everybody hates their EHR. Practice Fusion's intuitive charting allows you to quickly complete your notes so you can spend more time treating your patients and less time documenting visits. To begin charting, open the chart section. You'll see all of your recently accessed patients, and you can toggle to see 
your patient's schedule for that day. Clicking on the patient will open their timeline, giving you a chronological view of your records for the patient. You can access this from any window by clicking the preview icon. Use the Encounters dropdown to filter the timeline for relevant labs or note types. Summary gives you an at-a-glance overview of the patient's health history, including diagnoses, past medical history, advanced directives, allergies, and medications. You can edit any items or print records here. Use the profile section to manage demographics, contact, and insurance information for the patient. On the right, you can take action to enter orders, view access, and more. Return to the timeline to begin a note for this patient. To begin charting, select Encounter to start a soap note, or select the arrow to choose a custom note type. Note that custom notes have just one text area and are available for phone messages or other aspects of your workflow and are not tracked for meaningful use. Select the visit type at the top of the note and to help you navigate quickly, use the go to menu to jump to any area of the note. Similarly, you can search for any keyword as needed. Note the yellow clinical decision support reminders at the top of the chart, which can help you identify care gaps and... So what they're talking about there is when you get a chart, you'll, this will probably come up on your chart. It's all the stuff this person was supposed to have done that they didn't have done. So like with diabetes, which is a big, big deal, um, and basically we get judged on how our diabetics do, is did they get their retinal eye exam? And so they need an eye exam in the calendar year. So this will come up. So all of these, unfortunately it's very easy just to ignore these, but if you want to get good on all your metrics, um, this is going to help you. So that's where the EHR is quite good because it allows, it kind of prompts us to do the right thing. The problem is we do get what's called you know, click fatigue or prompt fatigue where you just start to ignore these, but it can be quite helpful. Preventative services for the patient. Take action to clear the notification or temporarily minimize them if desired. Select the encounter details to edit the treating provider, date of visit, or facility. Chief complaint will be populated if recorded when the appointment was created, though it can be edited. Enter vital signs and BMI will automatically populate. So obviously vital signs are vital. So always, like any time you see a patient, you should get vital signs. You know, some of the specialties don't, but especially in primary care we do. What's nice about this is we can track along all their vital signs. So typical vital signs are, um, you know, the, these are sort of the metrics, but basically blood pressure, temperature, pulse, and rest heart rate. Those are like the four main ones. O2 is supposed to be the fifth vital sign, which is that finger uh, pulse oximeter. Pain is the sixth one or fifth one. I guess it'd be the sixth one. Um, and so they're really looking at our pain scale, both what's the minimum plus the rest. Um, and for me, what I like is their BMI, because that gives me sort of idea of where they're at. Um, normal BMI is anywhere from like 23 to about 29. So if you're under 19, that's too light. If you're over 30, you're above your right away. Over 35, you're considered obese. Over 40, a BMI of 40, you'd be morbidly obese. And that's when you can have like bariatric surgery or those kind of things. So, um, the BMI becomes important. I've seen it happen where, you know, they'll actually just put the patient only weighing, se only being seven inches instead of 71 inches, and now their BMI is like a thousand. And so then you kind of know that somebody goofed up on what they're putting in. Um, and I just think uh, it's good for you guys to kind of look at the, the vital signs, because that's your first checklist to kind of have an idea of what's going on with the patient. View historical diagnoses and report, sort, well, real quick, the other thing you can do too that's real good on the vital signs, like I do with pediatrics, is it used to be a real pain, but now this makes it really good. Is you can print out their growth charts. You can get um, what their weight is compared to their height in what's called a growth chart. Um, so you guys probably have in your kid. And it's very nice. So the pediatricians, if you do pediatrics or you see them in the ER, they may want you to print out the growth chart and you do it from there. Filter and print as needed. View and update allergies medications, social history, or past medical history as needed. Now, start charting the note by clicking record next to subjective. Breeze through charting by selecting a template. So we're going to be talking about templates, but basically, let's say you're coming in for a wellness exam. Well, kind of a lot of that's similar. So they can actually get these templates, which we gave you some, and 
just kind of start you down this road and then you can minimize your free text. Then clicking on the line items to populate the notes. A double question mark will prompt you to enter a value when selected without having to click into the note. Type directly into the note or use dictation software to easily supplement. So there's something called Dragon Dictation and then Practice Fusion has its own um, voice dictation. Met your templates and use the previous tab to duplicate any information from a past visit note. Click Go to Objective to easily move into the next stage of the patient's chart. Under the Assessment section, Click the Diagnosis tab to add a diagnosis to this note. Select a diagnosis from the patient's chart or search for a new diagnosis by clicking Record. So that's where you can, like, if you're not sure what it is, you can say, like, broken bone, and they can make it as detailed or as uh, vague as you want. Select a start date. And that's a key thing. You want to start because you don't get credit for the diagnosis unless there's a start date. So I have a lot of we just had this for both our diabetics and like, I kind of more diabetics. But if they don't start, click the start date, then you don't get credit. And add comments as needed, then click done. Similarly, add a medication and be prescribed directly from the plan section. Just so you know, up, up here is where I put the MDM. So they don't necessarily right, automatically the have it, but um, you, that's where I kind of put that in. And these are the medications. Yeah. See our full e-prescribing walkthrough for step-by-step. Do you guys know what e-prescribing or that? So very little do I um, like call it the pharmacy, and even I only write the control substances. You can actually do the, the prescription here, or like my scribe will get it set up, and then I will double check it and then send it in. So when you write a prescription, again, that's a whole other way of how to do it. Um, it's very important to be super, super careful. You have to double check that they're not allergic. You have to double check that somebody does. That it's a, uh, you know, there's a lot of medicines that sound very similar to each other. So medical errors, you know, it's been said that you know, the doctors, the hospital, the whole system, you know, thousands of people die in you because of this kind of uh, mistake. So just be, if you're not obsessed compulsive, you need to become obsessed compulsive. I apologize. You just can't make a mistake with patients. Like the same. But usually we'll just do this through the HR and we'll send this over to the pharmacy uh, and that way we have it time stamped and coded as to when we will. Step instructions. To help with your... And then if you saw that right there, they have, it'll tell you about like that. See how there's these interactions? So you can have, um, it'll tell you you have these like this Lasix, and why they call it Lasix? So uh, it's a diuretic, so it's water -based. But it has interactions with ibuprofen, uh, the pseudoephedrine, and the lacinopril. So it goes for the kidney, so uh, ibuprofen actually is kind of, the side effect is um, organic nephritis and or interstitial nephritis. So the, the deal is that this is at least telling you to be careful, and then this is the kind of thing you may want to ask your provider, hey, there's a lot of interaction with this, or that, are we okay, and that kind of stuff. So I actually ask my scribe a lot, if there any, you know, I want to use this medicine, can you check, see, and then, you know, in the old days we had to like memorize all this stuff. Now you just put it in and see if it does interact. And if this medicine they're not taking it anymore, you can go in, take it out of that. So a lot of uh, things that kind of help you. Second part, they come in for like uh, an ear that's plugged. Oh, by the way, you had your mammogram. Anyone over 65, we're going to check and see if, you, if you're at risk for falling. We do a thing called the tug test. We have them sit on a chair, they got to get up from the chair, walk 10 feet, and come back. It's a time something test. So, all of that has to be put here. So, a fall risk assessment that someone might have to do, like I dinged on the last year, but it wasn't really documented. Um, have they, um, have you told them that they need their mammogram, the past year, 
colonoscopy. So that's the section that you'll see all that. Complete the screenings, interventions, assess. And then this is a typical thing for depression. Is a PHQ nine, PH, so PHQ two is a small like two questions. Are you depressed? Everybody every year asks me, "Ask you depressed." I'm depressed. To ask people about the depression, <laughs> but we just have to put that in there. And they, they have adolescent depression. They have adult. And I know it's important. It's just when you when they're for your foot and they're kind of bummed and not really happy with you, to have to go through That's this as a channel. Observations and quality of care fields as the. And then these kinds of things, like did you transfer care, did we um, do everything that we're supposed to do? So you can see it's just very honest, and that's why the you physicians will look. Manage your care plan, then send an instant fax referral to another provider by selecting add next to referral. Finally, record your billing codes and manage your super bill here. So that's where you would actually do the coding and billing, and you put it in the drafts, uh, and then the physician would go through, look at it, and then sign it. Save your note in the top right at any time and return later to review it. So you can you know, save it there or you can refresh it. Um, so it's kind so of nice to be able to. to make your chart a legal document. Please. So, key thing, let's read through this. This will permanently finalize this encounter as a legal document. You will not be able to make edits after signing. So, everything's legal. So, be very, very careful what you put in there. Please note, once the note is signed, it cannot. Now, you know, once it's signed, you can't do anything, but you can add addendum. So that top right, you would say, hey, you know, I already signed it, but I wanted to say, you know, they just brought back and they told me that this was a medicine wrong. So you put in the addendum. Again, that's totally legal to do. Copy edited or deleted. No, an addendum can be added anytime. Practice fusion streamlined charting means less time documenting and more time with your patients. So it's, it's a big challenge to get up to speed on the EHR. So, and, and you may be in a couple different EHRs, so um, it's just going to be one of the things that uh, you'll learn. About. So, so again, there's a lot of tutorials. I encourage you. Practice Fusion has a lot of free tutorials, so if you want to just get up to that, it's good. And then all the all them are very similar. You just kind of get up to it. But Practice Fusion by far has the most free videos on that. Um, and we talked about the counter. Um, I'm not sure if this one works. So, uh, now, Logan, yeah. you guys got sent? Yeah, I just sent everybody an email. Uh, there's four files in there, and you should be able to actually send this through to the guys, but it'll go along with the video that you place. This is, see, last year they didn't charge me for practice fees, they didn't charge me, so I couldn't get you all to charge my practice. Uh, so, uh, what we did was send you. Um, Basically, the template, and you guys can kind of fill it in while uh, this is Justin. You guys might have met Justin before we did the suture. Um, so, what we're going to do is talk about four cases, four scenarios. Uh, so, uh, this would be non traumatic knee, I think it's non traumatic shoulder, sinusitis, and diabetes. So, and I'm not sure how much you can hear of this and what it's going to come out. But we interviewed him using the template. So, if you guys want to just fill out the template, and then once you're finished, you can always send this to Logan and we can grade it for you if you want to get this back. So, um, do you guys have that? Anybody okay, got that? And if you're on a computer, that's fine. We can do this later for you. Um, so let's try this. So, everybody is ready? You guys got the template out? Let's get it.
Constant or 